Okay. We're about to start, so if everyone who's outside can come in and join us for the action and the fun. Good morning, everyone. Bonjour, buenos dias, bon dia, buongiorno, habari zasabui, salam alaikum, dosan. I think that's about all I can manage today, but welcome to Challenge Accepted, the first ever joint learning event co-hosted by the Climate Investment Funds and the Global Delivery Initiative here in Washington, D.C. at the World Bank. Uh, my name is Lana Wong, and I'll be your MC for today and tomorrow, as well as a lead moderator. So I hope we can make every minute count and learn as much as we can from each other and from the rich conversations that we hope to have over the next two days. So for those of you joining online and on the live stream, thank you and welcome. We'd love for you to be part of the conversation as well, so please feel free to add your thoughts and ideas in the comments section of the live stream using the hashtag challenge accepted. So before we start, we have a few housekeeping notes. Um, we've tried to make this a climate smart event. So you'll notice we haven't printed out any hard copies of the program. Uh, however, we do have flyers around with QR codes uh, on, on them. And if you scan this code with your iPhone camera, I don't know if you've ever done it before, I can do a quick demo. So you just get your camera on your, on your smartphone, hopefully, and if you, uh, hold it up to it and scan it, then you'll actually get immediately a link that you can use to download not only the agenda for the day, but also all the supporting documents for the events over the next two days. So hope that helps everyone. And also, if you're not already connected to the Wi-Fi, please search for the guest network um, using the Wi-Fi password that's on the screen and also on the flyers. Is anyone not connected? Okay, there you go. And if you don't have a smartphone or you're joining online, the full program and all the supporting documents is, are available on the CIF website, climateinvestmentfunds.org, and uh, go under events and you'll find challenge accepted. So uh, before we keep on going with uh, the morning, I'm gonna ask you to please check if your cell phones are on silent. And this is not the movies. I'm not going to ask you to put your phones away. I know we're all addicted to our screens, so actually keep your phones out. And we're actually going to do a little bit of live polling today so you can keep tethered to your screen. So if I can please ask all of you to open up your web browser and go to the URL on the screen, which is pollev, short for poll everywhere. So pollev.com forward slash Kwasik, K-O-U-A, S S I K seven six four. Now don't go online shopping, no Facebook, no Twitter right now. Please engage with us and go to this URL. And if you want to just give me a little wave of your phones once you've gotten on there, and hopefully once you type that link in, you will see the first question. How are we doing? And also for those of you joining online, you can do this too. We'd love to also just get a sense of, of everybody that is watching and joining us today. So if everybody is on the Polev site, oh, can you go back to the... So it's Polev, P-O-L-L-E-V, dot com forward slash Kwasik, K-O-U-A-S-S-I-K-764. Are we all there? Okay, thank you, thank you. Some thumbs up. Great. For those of you just joining, we're doing a little bit of live polling. So we'd love for you to uh, open up the web browser on your smartphones and join us or on your tablets or your laptops and join us so we can Get a sense of who everybody is in the room, how you're feeling. OK, I hope we can uh, start with our first question. If you have made it to the polev.com site, the first question is, how are you feeling today? Oh, good, we've got responses already. 
So for those, of the, for those three of you, the four of you who are a little bit neutral, I know it's a little crummy outside, you know, uh, you're stuck in here for possibly two days. We're going to try and make this as engaging as possible. So hopefully by the end of the day, we can move all of those little markers to the deep green of fantastic contentment to be here with your colleagues today. All right. Oh, well, at least we don't have any sad faces. So let's go on. Once you you're, have recorded how you're feeling today, then you should actually have a second question to go to. Whoops. So you shouldn't have to do anything yet. It should now pop up on your screen. Which country are you from? Let's get a sense of our audience here today, both here in person and online. Wow, look at that. This is why we love the World Bank. This is truly a global community. Look at that. North America, Africa, Europe, no Latin America, South America. Wow. <laughs> We've got a comic out there. I like it. It's a bit cold down there, but yeah, we're at a climate event, so. <laughs> Fantastic. No Aussies in the house? OK, that's quite a, quite a wonderful range. Thank you for that. And then the third question. That should pop up on your screen. What type of organization are you representing today? So this actually, we're going to build a word cloud together. So you can actually just type in you know, a one word description of, of who you're representing, whether it's government, multilateral development bank, a CSO, academia, a donor. Manu, do you want to put it on the screen? Ah, there we go. Great. And so. How this works, the, the more often the responses um, are given, the bigger. Uh, so it looks like we have a lot of N MDB actors here, government, academia, oh, think tanks, NGO, great, GDI. Peoples, I like peoples. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, indigenous people, sorry, that was the, that's important. Thailand. So it looks like there are definitely a majority of government folks here, the SIFs, MDBs. Any other outliers? What about activists? But I guess you're, <laughs> All right. OK. DFI. Government. Government. Wonderful. Bilateral. Keeps on going. Has everyone had a chance to respond? Great. Okay, and then a final question, one with a bit more meat on the bones. What is the one most effective thing you can do to help accelerate climate action? That's really the crux of why we're here today. So if you could boil it down to one thing, let's build another word cloud to hopefully inspire us for the next two days. Wonderful, educate, dance, <laughs> all right. Finance, veganism, emit less, biking, advocacy, climate conference, carbon footprints, finance. Finance is, is quite big there. Yep, we need money to create change, but we also need awareness, communication, education, advocacy technical information, sensitizing, feminist and women's solutions, traveling. 
All right, hope, I like that. Yeah, the travel, I guess, needs to be green travel somehow, right? <laughs> Learn, share, walk, invest, recycle, activate. I like that. Eat, but I hope that's eat less meat. <laughs> Reforestation, great. But it does look like finance takes the cake. Finance, awareness, and advocacy look like uh, the most common responses. Have, has everyone had their voice heard, their ideas on the screen? Great. Thank you. I hope that helped to wake you up a little bit and jog, jog the brain cells. Um, now we'd love to show you a, a very brief clip of a film that was launched earlier this year to celebrate the 10th anniversary of the Climate Investment Funds. So we can cue the video. From the rooftops of India to the Atacama Desert in Chile, from the cocoa plantations of Ghana to the restaurants of Nepal and beyond, change is taking root and transforming the way in which individuals, communities, and nations are thinking about the future. I, I think that for us to repair the amount of damage we have caused our climates so that we can leave it for posterity, it's time for all of us to get involved. So don't think that climate change conversation is for the government. Don't think that it's for the teacher. Don't think it's for the media person. You at home, what are you doing about it? We have everything we need to achieve our climate action goals and pave the way for generations to come. For lasting transformational change, we need to keep investing in the model pioneered by the climate investment funds. Together, we can make way for a safer, more prosperous future for all. Together, we can change the world. So I hope this short clip gives you a general framework for why we're here and inspires you to learn as much as you can over the next two days so we can all play our part in creating real and lasting change for climate action on the ground. So what is this challenge accepted all about? Well, as I said earlier, this is the first ever joint learning event co-hosted by the SIFS and GDI. And together, they really form quite a powerful partnership we're ex combining the experience of the world's largest multilateral climate finance instrument with one of the world's most extensive libraries of critical evidence-based delivery case studies. So in 2017, the SIFS and uh, GDI joined forces to better understand the operational challenges that climate projects face and how these projects adapt to overcome these challenges, combining GDI's unique evidence-based lens with SIFS on the ground expertise. This collaboration led to the development of six delivery case studies across Latin America, Asia, and Africa, which explore how practitioners on the front lines use adaptive management to address difficult development challenges. So over the next two days, we'll of course be doing a deep dive into these case studies, but you know, it's more than just those individual case studies. We're really gonna try and focus on the implementation challenges and how they were tackled. And we'll go beyond just those cases and also try and get the perspectives of the diverse practitioners, uh, players ranging from all, all the ones of you in the room, the MDBs, uh, bilateral organizations, academia, think tanks, foundations, and civil society, and how people are trying to use adaptive management strategies to create real and lasting impact on climate action. So as 16-year-old Swedish climate activist Greta Thunberg said, we cannot solve a crisis without treating it as a crisis. If solutions within the system are so impossible to find, we should change the system itself. 
So I think this, in the plain but powerful language of a teenager, speaks to the necessity of adaptive management in creating real and lasting change. So I think I've said enough. Um, please let me now uh, hand over the mic to GDI's advisory board co-chair, Margot Brown. Margot is a Canadian national and has 25 years of experience as a knowledge management practitioner. She has extensive leadership experience in both the public and private sectors where she has established numerous collaborative partnerships and developed and implemented innovative knowledge programs, including here at the World Bank. So please help me welcome to the stage, Margot Brown. Good morning, everyone, and welcome. I'm uh, really excited to be here today at this, this conference, co-hosted by the Global Delivery Initiative and the Climate Investment Funds. We are really grateful that so many of you are taking the time to be here for this joint event. Uh, I personally am looking forward to a lively exchange of vital ideas on a subject that is of really critical importance to our respective organizations to the development sector, and indeed to our entire planet. We know that confronting the complex issues related to climate is critical to ensure effective development. And the joint work of GDI and SIF offers a strong channel to confront these complicated problems effectively by more efficiently solving delivery challenges and by doing so in partnership with others. Now, many of you uh, may be familiar with GDI already, but for those of you who are not, I want to explain a little bit more about what GDI is and the kinds of issues that it was formed to address. GDI brings together about 50 partners from across the development sector, from governments, multilateral development banks, bilateral development agencies, representatives from academia, civil society, and the private sector, and more. What unites GDI's partners is a focus on collecting and sharing operational knowledge, insights, and lessons to better understand what works and what doesn't work in implementation. This means that GDI and its partners are focused intensely on delivery challenges. That is, the non-technical challenges and obstacles that arise during implementation. Figuring out how to effectively confront these problems is central to GDI's mission. We know that all development projects face challenges in their implementation. Sometimes these challenges are foreseeable and sometimes they come out of nowhere. They can vary widely depending on the country context, the sectoral idiosyncrasies, and even the dynamics of specific teams and individuals. But what these all have in common is the potential to derail profoundly the projects that they afflict. And they tend to cut across sectors and regions. So there's great potential to learn from each other if we find a common language to discuss them. Climate change challenges in particular illustrate in a very tangible way the critical importance of collecting learning and knowledge exchange. These are problems that no one can solve on their own. We need to learn on our respective implementation journeys and to share our insights with others so that we can become smarter together. When we first formed this partnership, we saw this as a real opportunity. In addition to its efforts to seriously scale up climate finance, SIF was founded with a mandate for collective learning at its core, helping the global community understand which approaches do and which do not work when it comes to climate change. And we're undertaking this partnership at the same time as we see ideas converging around the need to work more adaptively, have more agility in our operations, and to infuse learning into our collective efforts. Today's focus on climate change reminds me that the now so widely term, term adaptive management in development has some of its origins in the natural resource management field, which went back to the 70s. It pioneered systems thinking with the understanding that any intervention in an existing co ecosystem has extensive potential effects and diverse ramifications that ripple and branch out across ecosystems. 
This calls for careful monitoring, learning, and iteration while paying close attention to context. It also requires continuously recording both anticipated and unanticipated results, including the process that led to their achievement. As development practitioners, whether we're working at the global level or at the very front lines of delivery, we are not external to these delicate ecosystems of change. We are very much a part of them. Therefore, we have to learn from what we do. The GDI and CIF collaboration began a couple of years ago when we joined forces to better understand operational challenges that climate ch projects face and how to work adaptively to overcome them. It led to the development, as Lana mentioned, of six delivery case studies on how CIF projects tackled key delivery challenges. Over the next two days, we have the opportunity to learn from these cases and discuss their wider implications for how we work. These cases are part of GDI's growing delivery, uh, global delivery library, and they make an important contribution to our understanding of how interventions are implemented and how they capture valuable insights and lessons. These cases are also part of GDI's approach to connecting practitioners so that they can engage in problem solving together. Collective problem solving for complex and global challenges works best when we get out of our usual echo chambers and engage across institutions. I'm very happy and very pleased that we have such a broad representation from many stakeholder groups here at this conference, and I hope that you will take advantage of this valuable resource over the next couple of days. We're here to discuss how we can speed up doing and learning around climate change, one of the biggest and most pressing collective action problems of our times. It's no small task, but it is a task that we can tackle better and easier together. So once again, I'd like to thank you all for being here and for bringing to the table your respective experiences and, and perspectives. Thank you. Thank you, Margot. And now I'd like to introduce the head of the Climate Investment Funds, Mafalda Duarte. Mafalda is truly a global citizen as she has spent most of her career living and working in more than 30 developing countries. Recognizing that developing countries bear the brunt of climate change impacts, Mafalda has made helping countries build climate smart and resilient economies the focus of her career. Prior to taking the helm at the SIFs in 2014, Mafalda managed climate-related portfolios both at the African Development Bank and here at the World Bank. Please help me welcome Mafalda to the stage. Good morning, everyone. A lot of good morning, a lot of friends and colleagues uh, with whom we have also been uh, working over the past uh, few days. So uh, it's my pleasure to welcome you as well to this event. I really think it's a great theme, challenge accepted. You know, when I was uh, first uh, told by my team, this is the, the, the theme of the event, I said, this is a great theme, really. Challenge accepted, well done, GDI and uh, team and my own team. Um, so I hope you are all ready to take on this uh, challenge. Uh, for me to, well, the way I, I think about accepting the challenge uh, means really being open to learn and really being open um, to learn about what has worked, what hasn't worked, um, and, and being open to be surprised. I think uh, because we are all full of, um, beliefs and preconceptions, um, and so being open to being surprised. Um, I was actually very, very pleased as well to see that uh, we had um, uh, this short clip, I didn't know that we were going to have it, and to see that we started off with Ghana and the rapper um, in Ghana. Um, I was in Ghana mid of last year. Are our colleagues from Ghana here? Where? 
So I was in Ghana mid of last year visiting some of our projects under the, the forest uh, investment program. And really what I saw was quite incredible to me. Um, I saw really how we can reconcile things that might look a little bit unreconcilable to us. So when you think about uh, deforestation and forest degradation, you tend to think, or you might tend to think, you know, this doesn't go along with agricultural productivity or enhanced agricultural productivity and might not necessarily go along, you know, enhancing the livelihoods and reducing poverty in the communities that depend on these forests for a life. Well, what, uh, what I saw in Ghana proves that this is not the case. Um, and I know we are going to have a session that is going to tackle precisely about this case study. Um, and, and I saw it real life. I hope you will have a sense from what you will hear during that session. These things are not unreconcilable. But it very much depends on how do you deliver. What, are the, what is the way that one delivers the support to achieve the results? As I was um, starting that uh, visit, I read an advanced uh, draft of our GDI case study. Um, and to me, it was a really interesting read because it really gave me a much stronger sense. First of all, I got a lot more useful information that is not, that's sort of like intangible. You might not have access to it that easily. And it gave me a much stronger sense of appreciation about what I was about to see and how complex it is or it might be to get to these results which might look unreconcilable. Um, so I felt, um, I really felt a deep sense of, of, of appreciation and, and recognition of the work that the government uh, in its various institutions, the multilateral development bank, civil society, the communities um, were doing, including this wrapper. Because you know, what this wrapper is doing, he's a very popular figure in, in Ghana. He's also helping us by conveying the message and conveying it in a way that uh, the communities and the people in Ghana will understand and relate to. I'm not going to talk more in detail about Ghana because I don't want to spoil it for you uh, in the session that we are going to have. Um, but just to say, uh, Margot also said it in her uh, uh, introductory remarks, we take this mandate of ours in the CIF of being a learning laboratory uh, very seriously. And we have to, we must, because we are one of the largest multilateral climate finance mechanisms in the world. As you have seen in the screen as well, we have more than 300 projects in 72 developing countries in a very diverse set of areas from renewable energy to sustainable transport to agriculture to sustainable forest management to coastal zone management, to urban development. Um, and therefore, and, and the other thing that is very important is a lot of these investments are first of its kind investments, which means that the potential to learn is extraordinary. Um, and so we feel that obligation to support all of us, all of you, and many more out there um, to learn from this collective uh, experience that um, we have gathered over 10 years and really learn about these key challenges in delivery of, of climate action and how those were addressed. So it's very practical. This is very practical knowledge. This is for practitioners, but also hopefully for the practitioners to tell the policy makers and the decision makers, this is what you have to think about when you are thinking about policies um, or, or your decisions. I'm extremely happy with this partnership we have forged with the Global Delivery Initiative. Uh, so I congratulate those of, of you and my team as well for bringing this to our attention, uh, my own attention and Margot's, um, and, and proposing it. Um, because as Margot has said as well, we combine two powerful things. One is their experience on knowledge management and learning and gathering evidence and conveying it and our own experience um, of delivering climate action. 
and climate investments. So you will, what you will hear over the next two days hopefully will make you rethink about, as I was saying earlier, about beliefs that you might have or uh, preconceptions or conceptions and really um, help you take these lessons from these other pr practitioners into your own world and your own uh, activities. Margot is no longer here. She had another meeting to go to, but I would like to thank her and her team for all of this great collaboration and work, um, including in the delivery of this event. I would like to thank you all from governments, from the MDBs, from civil society, indigenous people groups, all of you here today uh, for having um, agreed uh, to embark on this journey with us, um, making this possible. I would like to thank my own team for all of the work they do and the work that they have done in making this possible. They are here, they, some of them over there. And again, uh, thank you all very much for being here, for having traveled from far and making this time to share and learn with us. Now it's time to accept the challenge and really transform our world one step at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Mafalda. So now we're going to move on to our high-level panel discussion. If I can call our panelists to the stage. Has everyone arrived? I'm sorry, I was not able to meet everyone before we started this. Claire Bernard, do we have Claire in the room? Great. So maybe as people are coming to the stage, we have Ricardo Puliti and Amali Amin, and Anselm Schneider joining us on the stage. Oh, goodness, okay. Our panelists need to be mic'd. So actually, Ricardo, have you been mic'd already? <laughs> oh, okay. We're going to circumvent the technical situation. Wonderful. So I actually will be seated here. And Claire, if you could take a seat here. And then Anselm, um, uh, sure, or we were, maybe if you could be in the middle and then Anselm at the, oh no, sorry, um, we wanted, or Ricardo, you could be next. I, oh, well now that we, we were, this was with, if we were having the, the mics, yeah. So Anselm, you could be here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. So, welcome, panelists. And this is our high level panel discussion on learning by doing the importance of adaptive management in delivering transformational climate action. So what is this panel all about? We've heard our introductory talks, and we know that we're really here to talk about the challenges, not necessarily uh, the su success stories. So we all know that our best laid plans don't always work out when it comes to the actual implementation. Um, climate projects, climate finance are uh, incredibly complex, and so bottlenecks inevitably can arise, obstacles get in the way, whether it's the finance or the capacity or the political will, accountability chains. Um, so we really want to kind of take a, a deep look into how players can pivot and adapt to the challenges to reach their ultimate goals and create that change on the ground that we all, all seek. So. Um, first, before we dive in, I'd like to just do some brief introductions of our esteemed panelists here on the stage. Uh, to my left, we have Claire Bernard. She is the Deputy Director General of the Planning Institute of Jamaica, where she is in charge of the Sustainable Development and Social Planning Division Cluster. She's a development planning specialist, and her portfolio has spanned a number of areas ranging from education planning to poverty reduction. She has been directly involved in climate action for over 10 years and serves on multiple boards, including the National Advisory Board, 
on climate change, and she's also the national focal point for the pilot program for climate resilience. Thank you, Claire, for being here with us. And then um, we have Anselm Schneider, who is the co-chair of the GDI Steering Committee and the program director of hospital partnerships for GIZ. Anselm is a leading public health expert with GIZ based in Bonn, Germany. He is, has extensive experience with multilateral organizations, corporate development, health system development, hospital management, the fight against HIV AIDS, and combating sexual violence. He has worked with the World Bank and the World Health Organization, as well as the private sector, and spent 15 years in different countries of Africa and Asia. Welcome, Anselm. And then we have Amal Lee Amin, the Chief of the Climate Change Division at the International, sorry, at the Inter-American Development Bank, the IADB. Amal Lee is a passionate advocate for sustainable development and her 20-year career spans government, MDB, academia, and nonprofit and think tank sectors. Um, at the IADB, Amal Lee currently leads a 60-person team for strengthening institutions, mobilizing finance, and applying knowledge in support of Latin American and Caribbean countries' efforts to implement the Paris Agreement. Amal Lee's PhD on policy and regulatory implications for scaling up investment in renewable energy in developing countries has been central to her life's work. Thank you, Amal Lee. And then finally, we have Ricardo Puliti, our senior director of, and um, the head of the energy and extractives global practice here at the World Bank Group. So in his role, Ricardo leads a team of 400 professionals in their work developing policies and financing in the global energy and extractives industries. The global practice has a portfolio of, wait for this, $52 billion, a pretty staggering amount of cash there. Um, prior to joining the World Bank Group, Ricardo was managing director in charge of energy and extractives at the EBRD, the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, and he led a group of 100 professionals there with a portfolio of approximately 11, euro, 11 billion euros. It's <laughs> so, <not mine>. <laughs> <laughs> too bad, yeah. So another fun and impressive fact, Ricardo is fluent in five European languages. So bravo. <laughs> All right, let's dive in. So my first question is for you, Claire. Um, what are some of the most consistent challenges and barriers to bringing about the systematic and transformational change that we need to promote a low carbon, climate resilient development in Jamaica? And can you give us some examples? I'm going to start by saying technology, because I'm sitting here, and I just can't log into my computer. Oh, no. <laughs> uh, but. Um, we have a number of challenges. Um, we have the issue of um, technology, we have finance, um, we have technical expertise, and a range. But the three I think I want to say are the most challenging for us um, are access to finance, um, good quality climate data and information to inform decision making and um, facilitate resource allocation. And the third one, so that's um, finance resource, and improving um, broad knowledge and understanding on the ground, sensitization of the entire nation, be it the private sector to bring them on board, persons in communities to help them to understand the role that they can play, or in the government itself, policymakers and technocrats alike. I think those for us are the three most critical um, barriers um, to implementing um, climate action. Great, thank you. Um, and so if we can then move to maybe uh, Amal Lee to get, or actually let's start with Ricardo and then Amal, uh, both with the MDB perspectives, but could you reflect on some of the biggest delivery challenges that MDBs face in the implementation of climate change projects and some examples of adaptive management that you've seen that have helped to overcome these challenges? Okay. First of all, a, a big thank you. Very, very happy to be there. Um, um, I have to say I'm very happy that there is a panel on doing because I'm I'm very keen on uh, on on delivery. I think it's it's very 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 important. Uh, I have to say, 
I think that all projects, they change little by little. So I think that many of the issues that you find in normal projects, you find them also in projects that deal with climate finance. Um, I mean, classical think, lack of limited capacity of, uh, of the public counterpart. Um, what kind of not good technical knowledge about what is being on offer and what can be done, uh, kind of um, limited understanding of, of financial structures or economic structures. Actually, I was so pleased that our our colleague from Jamaica, the first word she said, it's a word which is very 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 close to my heart, which is planning, and this is something. This is actually something that we find. Uh, is usually limited in many of the developing countries where we work. So you see, at the moment that planning is limited, first of all, we should, we should address the problem of having better planning from every conceivable viewpoint. But in addition, it immediately makes you understand that you have to adapt because you are not going to be uh, with uh, the political cycle, you are not going to have the, the same kind of, of problems you, you used to have. So adapting is necessary in every business. It is particularly necessary in climate financing. And also I think what is very, very important is, is to be able to educate the, uh, the public counterpart, and educate sounds so bad, but let's say working together, trying to push the boundary of knowledge of the, of the World Bank, of other sister institutions, uh, but also of the client, in order that a lot of uh, issues around, around uh, opportunities, I should say, around climate finance are, are well understood, because we think that actually there is a lot of misunderstanding. Examples, you have a lot. I mean, I, I've been given four pages of examples, which maybe I should be... <laughs> I should be ashamed of because you say, wow, great planning, Ricardo, by the way. And uh, <clears throat> what I have to say is that, for example, take uh, South Africa, ESCOM. I mean, I don't want to, uh, to it's not about, it's not a judgment value. It is just a, 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 a situation we faced. Uh, South Africa tried to, de to develop CSP, so uh, concentrated solar power. Uh, it was quite interesting that many of the bidding process, many of the offers presented under the bidding process were not really uh, really the ones that the government and was looking for, as ESCOM was looking for. So at the end, it came a, 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 a solution that CSP would not be high in the strategy of South Africa. You know, we could have cancelled. That's it. We cancelled the amount. Goodbye. Thank you very much. Well, we work together with ESCOM, with the government, and now we are financing 1,440 megawatt hours of batteries that will facilitate the uh, penetration of solar and wind. So you have to think. I mean, I know it's a little bit of a, of a cliché, but I think that what is requested by to all of us uh, is to really be, be quick to, to change, to adapt, make sure that we reach the objective, even though maybe we didn't go there with the car we wanted to go in the first place, but we got there. So that's a little bit, yeah. Great, thank you. Amali, could you give us your perspective? You. Yeah, is that, no, that's not Oh, hello, yeah, I got it. <laughs> Um, well, thank you, yes, and we really value this initiative. Um, I mean, of course, all the work of Mafalda and the team at the admin unit, and, and now this uh, really important collaboration with the Global Delivery Initiative. Um, so the SIFs, you know, the SIFs now, there are a lot of results on the ground, and that's great, and, and all of those um, really interesting projects now are starting to be learned about, and we're really starting to see uh, and hear from people that are having their lives positively impacted, which is amazing. But I think it is also important, as this initiative emphasizes, to recognize the, the process by which we got to those results, because that really is the learning we need to capture and we need to replicate. There's a lot of tacit knowledge in those projects from the people who led those projects, 
and who potentially can go and replicate in other contexts. But it's not, not good enough for that to just remain in those individuals. We have to ensure our organizations are learning. And our knowledge um, uh, team uh, are involved in this within the uh, GDI initiative. And so we're really hopeful that we can take a lot of the lessons and ensure they go beyond the usual suspects, not just those who are trying to drive the climate agenda, but actually all of those who are trying to deliver on, on uh, resilient water, on the low carbon energy transition, it has to be mainstreamed, this learning and knowledge that has been generated. So this is a really, really important initiative. So I think, um, uh, just to give a couple of examples, because I think where we can really learn is often from the, the cases where maybe things didn't go smoothly. Absolutely. Um, and where we did have to adapt, where we had to bring in new uh, approaches. That's, I think, uh, a lot of critical learning that we have to capture. A couple of examples. I know you'll hear later, I think in the afternoon, one of the IDB's uh, projects in Honduras for clean cook stoves and new business models. So you'll hear a lot about that. I'm not going to touch on that now. I don't want to steal their thunder. Um, but uh, uh, a couple of projects which I think the challenges are very similar, both in the case of Peru with the Forest Investment Programme and also in Bolivia in, uh, under the pilot programme on climate resilience, uh, where we've been focusing on um, helping to increase resiliency of the water sector. In both those programmes, it, was, it became really clear that they would not succeed unless the indigenous communities were fully on board, not just consulted, <laughs> but fully involved and and fully part of the programs. And uh, in the case of Peru, that, um, that may have slowed down, and it did slow down the um, uh, submission to uh, the Trust Fund Committee of that program, because uh, there was a process being developed at the national level to develop this very, very consultative, inclusive process where indigenous communities were engaging with the government on the activities that the FIT would be supporting. And, you know, of course, other related activities. And so that took some time. I think anyone who's been involved in multi-stakeholder consultation with different um, different interests knows that to do that well, it's a it's it's a lengthy process. It's not a one-off discussion. You have to obviously listen and absorb, respond, and you know, and it can be a very and needs to be a very iterative process. So that was very important to the FIP, and I think similarly in Bolivia, when it came to looking at how to uh, promote water re uh, resiliency in the water sector, particularly for um, El Alto, the second biggest city after La Paz in Bolivia, which was looking uh, like it was going to be running out of water, it became clear that one of the key um, issues was to ensure that the indigenous farmers, who potentially could have uh, decided that they would... Uh, take control of the water supply to um, uh, ensure that they could use it for their needs, which could have ultimately led to um, not having enough water, not being able to supply water to El Alto. So clearly those farmers and those communities had to be involved in whatever solution was identified. And through the process, and it, again, very lengthy, very, um, a lot of on the ground engagement with the communities, it became clear that to those communities that actually they could benefit through the PPCR because resources could be brought to increase the um, uh, efficiency of their own water management systems for farming. And in doing so, then they would also be comfortable with allowing more water resources to be passed on to El Alto. And so avoiding potential for conflict further down the line. Now that didn't happen overnight. It was, um, and in fact, I talked to the head of our water division about the project when it was going to the board. And he said, this is probably the best prepared project we have ever taken to the board in terms of the amount of real on the ground consultation and engagement. Now, how do we ensure that that is built on and how do we ensure that we that this becomes the norm? Because I think when we think about the challenges of climate change, whether it's the low carbon transition, whether it's building resiliency, it's essential that citizens, communities, um, whether indigenous communities or other communities feel that this is uh, ac these activities are going to benefit them they're going to have positive impacts on their lives and then that can 
create a reinforcing positive loop to the governments who then see the benefits, not just from a climate change perspective, but for the local communities and the local economy as well. Fantastic. Great. So, Anselm, I'm not leaving you out. Let me, <laughs> um, you actually have a very unique lens on all of this, as your expertise is uh, not necessarily in climate, but in the health sector. Um, and also, you also have your extensive experience with GDI. So why do you think learning from challenges and adaptive management is an important approach for project implementation? And do you have examples, perhaps, from the health sector that you think the climate sector could learn from? Yelena, please, thank you for having me. Let me start by saying I, I feel kind of alone. Uh, I'm not from climate. Uh, I don't believe so much in planning. And uh, <laughs> that's a good question. That's but why we saved you for last. Maybe after yeah. my point, you, my intervention, you're going to understand. Um, let, let me start by, by saying I'm a medical doctor by training, and wherever I go, I tend to claim that health is the most complex of all the sectors. And right here now, with you people from climate, I must admit I respect because I think that climate <laughs> is even more complex than, than health. And I think there's good reasons for me. From an outside perspective, looking at climate, hmm. in health we have, uh, I always start from the human being, right? As the building block, the actor, the one who has to change, the one who's building the systems and so on. And humans, we have something in health, we call it recall bias. So if I ask you the date of your last cold or flu or headache, you may know for yesterday, maybe last week, last month, last year, never ever. So we know that humans are very weak on memory, right? So I guess, and on top of that, we have senses. We can feel weather, but we certainly don't feel climate change in the sense of one degree up or down. We just don't feel it. It's not triggering hot cognition in human beings. It's not triggering change. So that's why, and on top of that, I mean, it's complicated for you and I guess your business, but then you have those political powers, right? It's, in the heart of what type of economy do we wish for the future? I come from Europe, from Germany, and in my place, it's not so much about building green energy. We have tons of green energy. It's more about avoidance, doing less. Mm -hmm. Less travel, uh, smaller houses for heating in the winter, and how many cars do you need? That is trade-off. It doesn't come like progress. It feels bad. So you have political clashes. And I guess that's the landscape, the environment you're working in. So I have a lot of respect. Let me take you to Germany for a very short story. Very short story. Imagine mid-sized hospital last year, real story. My wife, she's a doctor, the better doctor. My kids call me the paper <laughs> doctor. But she is doing the real thing, treating people, right? <laughs> Highly specialized and so on. So last year, this is what happened mid-sized hospital somewhere in Germany, right? A patient was not doing well, right? They decided for medical reason we need to assist him with breathing, respiratory assistance, right? They put him in a different room, they put on the machine, the nurse was doing that, and immediately after putting on the machine, the machine started to do all kinds of noises. So the nurse felt, okay, this machine is not working properly. She went to see that she tried something, unplug, replug, changing parameters, still noise, right? Beep, beep, beep. She went seeing the doctor. Doctor came in, same thing, okay. What's wrong here? The machine is still pumping air, the, the, the patient is breathing apparently, but the machine is not working properly, right? They called the technician, real story. They called the technician. Took a while, technician came in checked the machine, sorry doctor, everything right with the machine. Machine was still doing noise. So apparently the machine was pumping air. So what did they do? They turned off the sound and let the machine continue. Then hours later, there was a change in shift. New nurses. The new nurse came in and went to see the patient with the, with the, the nurse from the earlier shift. She came back and she told them, the machine has no problem, but your patient is dead. 
Oh. That is a real story. And w why do I share that with you? I mean, it's kind of tragic. Probably they couldn't have saved that patient anyhow, right? But it explains very nicely from a GDI perspective the difference between a development challenge mm. and a delivery challenge, right? The development challenge here was we want to improve the health of the patient. Everybody agreed, right? Nobody was in a way. They had all the resources, specialists, doctors, machine maintained, power, nurses, light. They had everything, even a, a single bedroom for the patient. So it was not a, an issue of training or resources or maintenance or whatever we often find, right? So development challenge, everybody agreed. But kind of something went wrong, right? Mm. In communication, maybe, probably, if somebody with a fresh brain, that's what happened hours later, somebody from outside with a fresh brain who didn't buy in in the first place in the hypothesis, the machine is wrong, came into that picture that helped immediately seeing the real deal, right? Mm. So they were focusing on that delivery challenge, right? It changed uh, the, the, the hypothesis, I guess. So that, that's something when, from, from a medical point of view, we're dealing with humans, and if I look at what we're doing in development, often we we handle we intervening in systems that are built with human beings, right? So it's living systems, right? It's not a machine we're dealing with; it's people, indigenous people, politicians, planners, right? It's people. So if you build a system with people, for me, by definition, it's biology. Mm. It's organic. When will we stop to think that they behave like rational machines? They will never ever do that. So if you come from that organic angle, right? Mm. Is there any alternative to being adaptive? Let me put that in another image or picture. I have three kids and I guess most of you do have kids. When a kid is born, do we sit down and write a plan for how to bring up that kid during the next 10 years, and then we roll out our plan. <laughs> we would never, never, ever do that, I guess, in most of the cultures. Why the heck do we think that in development we can do that? So this is just for making the case that adaptiveness, to me, in biology, there's no alternative to that, and agility, right? And that's why I felt like probably it's uncomfortable position here with people talking about <laughs> planning and even professionals of planning. Thank you. Thank you. Amazing. <laughs> A tragic but very powerful, powerful example. And I'm going to talk to the planner now, Claire. Um, <laughs> so uh, yeah, 10 years ago, um, Jamaica joined the CIF as a pilot country. So what have you learned from the CIF's experience with this connection, um, also to this GDI evidence-based approach, the link between the planning and the actual implementation. Um, and how do you think this learning can help you address some of the challenges that you spoke about earlier? The first question. Uh, so as a planner, I have to stay on. <laughs> On point. <laughs> I have to be interested in information, I have to be interested in access to resources, and I really do have to stay with having people understand what's happening, what they need to know, the kind of information they need to have um, to take action. And I'm looking at that because as government there's a scarcity of resources. Mm -hmm. And before we joined the CIF, we used to go to the Ministry of Finance to try to ha get resources for climate change, for adaptation. What were we using? We were simply saying, oh, we've had several storms in the past decade. Look at how the droughts have been impacting those kinds of things. With the CIF, we've understood the benefit of having a pool of dedicated resources. So it's there, we go to the Ministry of Finance, we say, we brought in some grant resources, we brought in some concessional loan resources. 
We've also used those resources to do some climate modeling. This is what the information is saying. We've also been at the same time documenting our experiences on the ground. We've been able to say to you that in the upper Rio Mina Valley, where when we had the last heavy rains, the farms that had put in live barriers on the, with the assistance of the SIF and also the adaptation funds, they reported less damage than those who had not. So we need that kind of information. Um, we also um, need the benefit of stakeholder empowerment. And the SIF has been very, very strong on that. And we've We've, we've embraced that. We've, we've seen um, Amali spoke about the quality of the projects developed from that kind of involvement. We can say that, and I, I think the, the, the short film we used at the beginning um, with the rapper, we're doing similar things in Jamaica because we're understanding, learning from the SIF experiences that you go to the people with themselves so they understand what needs to be done. And we are using local popular artists working alongside the scientists at the University of the West Indies to translate the climate message um, in a way that helps them to understand how adapting or mitigating um, improves their viability and their livelihood and general the quality of life. But there is a Jamaican, former Jamaican Prime Minister who died recently, who says it takes cash to care. And again, through the SIF, we have established two financing mechanisms through which we can care with cash. It doesn't make sense you go to people and you say, oh, you need to do this and you need to do that. But when you use those, when you, you, you're able to give them resources, it helps them to do what you're asking them to do, what you're demonstrating to them that you need to, um, they need to do. And so we have what is called the climate change line of credit, which is available to, um, small, to micro, small, and medium-sized enterprises to help them to adapt in their, um, their businesses to safeguard their livelihoods. And we have the Special Climate Change Adaptation Fund to help um, communities do small adaptation projects. And um, to date, we have spent about $3 million US dollars working in various communities doing um, those, those kinds of things. So again, for us, Doc, um, the information is, <laughs> is very important, whether it is scientific information translated to um, local understanding. The planning is important because um, we exist in an environment of scarcity, and we have to demonstrate to our colleagues who are allocating resources why. And so when we have those climate projections, we are able to do that, and that better information helps all of us to understand everything better. That's great. Thank you. So I'm going to go from the planner back to, to Anselm, actually, uh, if you don't mind, because if you can maybe put your GDI hat on um, and try and make that connection to the importance of partnerships and collaboration. I mean, we all talk about and we all know how critical partnering and collaboration is to reach our goals, but you know, sometimes that doesn't necessarily happen. Sometimes it's difficult and the transformation doesn't happen. But what is different and unique about GDI, the Global De Delivery Initiatives kind of coalition? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I like that question. Uh, let me start by saying what we are not. I mean, I, I went, we went to UNDP in New York last year and they were counting the number of knowledge management platforms. Guess what? It's more than 50, just in development, right? So it's, we are not the only platform in knowledge management, not. We are certainly by far not the only one in any given sector, right? But we are the only one coming from that angle of delivery challenges. So the way we organize knowledge at GDI is according to delivery challenges, right? 
So you can approach that from a regional angle, from a sectoral angle, right? But we don't ask the question, what was your development challenge? Cook stoves, or I don't know, uh, carbon dioxide market, or whatever, right? Mm -hmm. We ask the question, when you implemented that program, that task, that operation, what comes in your way? That is specific, highly specific about GDI. Second thing that is specific about GDI, in my understanding, is um, you know, we all have tons of books back home, or these days not books, but uh, e-books probably. <laughs> we are not short of reading material, right? Is anybody here in the room who needs a book because he has nothing to read? <laughs> I don't think so. We are overwhelmed by information, overwhelmed, right? In, in development in general, right? Mm. Best cases, even better cases, uh, and so on and so forth. <laughs> All kind of stuff is out there already, right? There's nothing that hasn't been written yet. What we are missing is, I go back now to health, for instance, right? We always think that it's more technical expertise and more resources and maybe a better plan that's going to solve this thing. But actually, we never ever, we rarely acknowledge that it's project management that is making a difference, good or bad project management by the end of the day is making a hell of a difference when an operation hits the ground. Mm. And what is good project management, you know better than I do. There are so many soft success factors in that, right? Mm. Growing trust, understanding people, right? Inspiring change. Can you, I mean, is that like a computer software or so? It's not, it's deeply human. And when you see the two operations with, we coming from the same schools, right? Universities, everybody's having one PhD, two PhD, right? It's not the skills that we, I mean, it's not the, the technical knowledge, I guess, maybe at, at times, because you have some of your aspects is very specific. So GDI is a place where you can exchange around delivery challenges. And what is special, remember my nurse, the new shift noise came in, fresh brine, not into that problem. Mm -hmm. We offer that. If you have that machine beeping constantly and you need a fresh nurse, come to GDI, right? We offer you that fresh nurse. <laughs> she or he will not be World Bank. You might come from a different organization. And what we learn in GDI, and that's really fascinating to me, is we saw that, remember, when, with, with your former World Bank president, science of delivery? Mm. That, the, the concept of science of delivery, I still, I'm still struggling with that. It's, it's, it's more than science, right? We have constant debate at GDI, whether it's science or craft or art, what you're doing when you implement a program. I tend to think it's a little bit of each of it, right? You need science, you need that information, and you need good information, and you need to digest it. You need craftsmanship or craftswomanship, and you need art, right? Absolutely. You need to inspire, you need to look at the picture, you need to have, to, to take people with you, right? To do something fascinating. You need all those ingredients, right? So what we offer at GDI is we offer an exchange across organizations. We learned that if you take a bit, uh, a case, right, a piece of knowledge, a solution that you've done in World Bank will not work back home in my organization, which is GIZ, right? Mm -hmm. A solution we can go in GIZ will not work with World Bank. Why? The framework of our organizations is so different. Business models are different. One delivery challenge, maybe a huge delivery challenge with IDB, but in your planning organization, you have solved it already, right? So there's a lot of wells in opening up across organizations. So GDI is offering that protected space where the nurse can say to the other nurse, sorry, this machine is constantly beeping, it's driving me crazy, I tried everything. Can you with your fresh brain have a look at it? That's GDI end. If you want to see that happen tomorrow when we go to those delivery labs, that's exactly what will happen. 
nurses talking to each other. So that's the idea. Thank you. Great. Here's to fresh, fresh brains. So Amali, I saw you nodding. Maybe you yeah, I wanted to come back on a particular point. But I must say, when Anson was giving that story, I, I was thinking, all this folks on the beeping, thinking, well, what about the patient? Who's looking at the patient? Um, so it's a shame it didn't happen until the shift change. But I just wanted to also highlight, because I think, um, I mean, Claire, I was involved in the early days in PPCR in, in Jamaica um, with Claire and her colleagues. And um, I think, you know, everything Claire said is actually, you know, has been really essential, developing a stronger long-term vision, a longer-term plan, and then bringing everyone around the table to work out how to deliver it. But I do also want to highlight one component of the Jamaica project that Claire didn't mention that actually probably will address some of the points that Anselm's making. We produced a pop song. Well, you produced a, a pop song because it became clear, I don't know if pop song, maybe reggae song, I don't know if pop's the right word. Um, it became clear in Jamaica that a lot of culturally, if we wanted to raise awareness of people in Jamaica around climate risk and climate uh, impacts, that the best way of doing that was through music. And I mean, I, it's a shame we don't have it. It'd be oh, great to put it up because it's a great it, song as well. It up, yeah. <laughs> um, it's, and I guess Jamaica's not one of the case studies, so it probably won't come out. But we recognize, and the SIFs, and I think, and I just want to go back to the point that Margot made earlier on that um, and why I think the SIFs have been and are and will continue to be successful is the approach has always been we have to take a systems approach, we have to see the whole ecosystem. It's not just about one project here or a bit of technical assistance over there or uh, coming up with a great reggae song that raises awareness of the local uh, people around climate change. It's putting those all together and recognizing and explicitly developing a new ecosystem or, or changes to ensure that a new ecosystem evolves in a way that is delivering on resilience in the case of Jamaica and the PPCR. And I think, you know, being able to bring that out and draw those lessons into other work that we do. I mean, we at the IDB um, have also tried to look at how we can incentivize that type of action through other resources that we can attract in addition to the SIFs. Mm. Uh, of course, we, we love the SIFs, but you know, recognizing that uh, we, we need to bring as many resources as possible to incentivize this much more systematic uh, type of working, working across silos, ensuring that we're bringing different expertise and different activities together for the benefit of changes that really bring positive impacts for people and recognizing it's not just about greenhouse gas reductions, it's not just about uh, reducing uh, s uh, certain climate impacts to certain communities. You know, those are important, of course, but also the development impact and the transformational impact on people's lives has been core to the SIFs from the beginning. And I think that approach, and that's why I, you know, I'm delighted that the GDI has partnered to bring out elements of that, because I think it can be very underrated how uh, the SIFs have had this very, um, very specific, explicit approach on changing eco the ecosystem of uh, communities and sectors and uh, how different uh, technologies and business models are developed. Great. So that really does speak to the power of this partnership. Um, it sounds like a win-win for, for everybody and for the, the wider mm -hmm. world and beyond. So, Ricardo. I'm, I'm the last one, which is always good. Because <laughs> And talk about planning. I saw the lady. Yeah, I, I saw the the lady in the first row with uh, sounds like ten minutes left. Oh goodness, That's good I planning. missed that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Listen, um, I think it's a very interesting conversation, and actually having Anselm here makes it less technical. If not, it could have been a very dry conversation. I'm um, I'm a big believer in planning because. Uh, an hospital, and Anson knows it very well, is an example of planning. I mean, you cannot, one thing is the human being, one thing is the, uh, the, the community of human being. It's far more complex. So <clears throat> I think a lot of things have been said, but I have two, three points actually that I would like to make. And allow me to, to go a little bit higher than, uh, than uh, infrastructure and, uh, and all the rest. At the end, it's all about uh, human 
development, human capital, call it as you want, uh, from the individual to the biggest community, which is the, I think we are 8 billion around in the world. So what I want to say is that um, there is a need to, to share learning, and I have to say, this is not going so well as we may think. I was at the IDA meeting on Monday here at the World Bank, and then you have always the same number. 840 million people don't have access to electricity. Uh, 4 billion people, I know it's 10 minutes, but it was 10 minutes two minutes ago, so something is wrong. <laughs> <laughs> then you have 4 billion people don't have access to, to broadband. That's really a problem. Then you have 2 billion people without access to all-weather road at a distance of 2 kilometers, for example. So you realize that the, the problem is, is very, very, very complex. So I think that an exchange, sorry, a deepening of knowledge, an exchange of knowledge is definitely necessary. And I'm sure GDI is doing a very, very good job, and I can only can only uh, praise that. In addition to, to, to share knowledge within institution, within countries, and uh, across, is the other thing which is building consensus. Because you see, in complex human organizations like governments or big institutions, you can teach and learn whatever you want, but if there is no consensus, it doesn't go anywhere. And political institutions are typical of that. And I would say for me, the most, I mean, I went to Katowice for COP, uh, I think it was 24, uh, around uh, six months ago, five months ago, and you could see that mm, the kind of uh, support to climate change was not what it was five years ago. And then you go, uh, you go to France and you see yellow vest or, or gilet jaune or whatever. And then, you know, I was quite attracted by their motto, because their motto is towards the people who are in government, and thank God we change continuously, which is good, uh, which is, you know, you think about the next 20 years. I, need, I think about how to feed my children next week. So you see, it is, this dichotomy doesn't work, really. So I think consensus is the most important thing, sharing the information with a, a ultimate goal, which is to, to have a consensus behind the actions to be done. And then you go down in the developing countries one by one, you see that when projects fail, or where you have to, to do a lot of extra work that you didn't plan, but you are adapting, is because probably not everybody was pushing in the right direction. So it is something which is really necessary. And I finish about uh, partnership. I mean, I was given examples that, of course, but there is nobody's fault here. The examples are very technical. They tell me, you know, Ricardo, Morocco, uh, the first round of renewables investment, there was not enough good coordination between subcontractors, but then the tender documents were changed and everything worked. It's a great example for people like me that are engineers. You know, what can I do? <laughs> Nobody's perfect. <laughs> so I suppose this kind of people, I don't know if we should be eliminated. I don't know if something like that. Uh, but um, it, it makes you think, really, uh, because, and then, of course, Morocco has done incredibly well in renewables, incredibly well. But then how are we going to move the experience of Morocco to other countries without having, many times, the cultural pushback? I, no, I don't want to learn from that. I want, so you see, I think that at the end of the day, uh, it is very, very important to, in my opinion, even a book, a new book, or I would say a new app, or I'm, I'm, I'm the old generation, but anyway, a, a new app or whatever is not one too many. Because knowledge and education generate consensus, which is so important at the level of uh, people who try to build bridges and tunnels and uh, power plants and uh, distributed energy and all the rest. Uh, so I think it's, it's really that, planning uh, adaptation, adapting models, uh, projects, it is all towards building consensus because ultimately that will give the long-term push towards a common action.
Agreed, agreed. Now, we had more questions planned here, but I also know we're running a little bit short on time, and we did want to open it up. She has another. Uh, she has another. <laughs> so if we have any burning questions, um, we'd love to, to have them and field them. We, may, we could potentially run over a little bit, and that would just eat into your coffee break if uh, the conversation wants to go on. But do we have any burning questions from the floor here or also from our online audience? OK, great. Then maybe, actually, we did have, um, oh, did we, if you have a question, uh, can someone bring a mic to, thank you. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this is Shamsur Ravan Khan. I'm working in the Ministry of Environment and Forest and Climate Change, Government of Bangladesh. And first, I'd like to thanks to the CIF and Global Delivery Initiative for organizing this very learning event, because it's very helpful for us. I mean, I start with the, you know, uh, let me reiterate, reiterating the, the, the video that has been mentioned. Is not the, you know, the professionals, the teachers, the doctors that we can deal with the climate change. It's about the whole society. Mm. Uh, that's important. And also the, the just Ricardo mentioned is about the individual to the whole system of the government. So as you know, we are talking about the high ambitions target. So as Claire mentioned, as you know the limitations in all the developing countries, the knowledge, the finance, the technology, if we don't you know, take on board the private sector, if we don't have the investment in the technology, I mean the whole effort as we are planning and as you know the situation, I mean the, the determined contribution that all we have submitted, that indicates 3.50 degrees C. See, if we don't have put the lot of ambition target by taking all of them on board and putting a lot of resources to the technology, then I don't know what would be our you know, next course of action. So I like to you know, have some comments if you know, Ricardo would like to mention. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, Ricardo? Listen, I, I think you are absolutely correct in what you just said. Uh, the private sector is a, a very important player if you want to achieve, uh, if you want to achieve uh, the 2 degrees or 1.5 degrees objective. Uh, and when I say the private sector, please don't don't think only about the industrial companies that uh, can invest and provide uh, and provide um, cleaner kind of uh, energy or more uh, resilient kind of infrastructure, uh, or I'm sure a better hospital. Uh, by the way, I'm thinking about the, infra the hospital as an infrastructure, of course, uh, and what is contained in the, in the hospital or in a school is, is absolutely the same. I also take into account into that uh, capital markets, because at the end of the story, uh, you need the banking system, you need the, the financial capital markets, both local and international, to be part of the private sector story. It is not the private sector only. But you see, uh, I think you're absolutely right to evoke the private sector, but it is also necessary that uh, in order for infrastructure in general and climate change in general as well, it's not a matter of private sector. It's a matter of private and public sector together. This is absolutely necessary because we go back to the consensus thing. You know, uh, I think that we've seen in so many places in the world, and I'm sure my, my friend here from, from the IDB has the same examples, where involved in the private sector as, uh, as determined a huge pushback from the population. Because the private sector, and I, I think that's good in that way, uh, has a duty to provide uh, a return to their shareholders. If they're listed, they are checked every three months, by the way, every quarter. So you can see this kind of a quarterly need to show results doesn't often match the requirements need, and I would say even more, the population need. So I think that uh, every time we talk of climate change, I like to think that where we are to a certain extent failing, is to have 
the public and the private sector delivering kind of uh, delivering invest long term sustainable investment models where this can happen uh, so this is a, a little bit what i'm thinking then i agree with you as well when you say look at the end uh, we need more investment in technology i'm i'm a big believer that if we will when i don't want to say if when we will solve the climate change huge danger which is on our head because you see you see regrettably when someone pass it is something that happens now but if i tell you that uh, in many african cities you have 20000 death every year because of local poll pollution since they don't have a name you know it's a statistics so i mean we have to we have to to solve that and i think technology can and will help and that's why I, when I see Claire, I respect her enormously because planning with the kind of technological disruption we are experiencing now, well, chapeau, I mean, it's so difficult. Mm -hmm. You are planning for the next 10 years when technology will change in six months. We mm -hmm. saw it in batteries here. Mm -hmm. Uh, until 18 months ago, I didn't have anything in batteries, nothing whatsoever. I have $2.5 billion in batteries in, in, in 18 months. So this is what I'm, I have to say. But your points are completely taken. I don't know, I mean, if you want to add. If you, um, yeah, no, just to add, and I think a little bit on the um, capital market solution, because that was another example of how we had to adapt a project um, in Mexico where We've been trying to engage commercial banks uh, to finance uh, energy efficiency of SMEs, corporates mainly, and there was just really no interest there. So um, rather than say, okay, we're not going to do anything here, we actually d decided to think, okay, well, what are the alternatives? And we decided to develop actually a very highly innovative uh, financial structure to um, bring in the capital markets for that uh, under the CTF for Mexico. Um, so a green bond securitization um, vehicle where we aggregate all those loans from the corporates into a special purpose vehicle using CTF resource and IDB uh, private sector resource uh, provide a guarantee to securitize that into the market. And that should be, those bonds should be issued hopefully soon <laughs> um, and you know but I think that was a really interesting case of how you know we weren't seeing interest we weren't seeing demand uh, we didn't give up we didn't say oh well okay energy efficiency isn't important we know it is uh, the commercial banks uh, were not interested and and part of the reason they may not have been interested is a fear that these loans may not be easily refinanced into secondary financial markets so what we did we created a secondary financial market solution ultimately sh that should also then incentivize commercial banks and you know that innovation really happened as a result of the fact we encountered a lot of resistance so i think you know just to bring that back that point and the importance of thinking innovatively when we engage the private sector particularly great yes Ricardo. because i remember one thing and i think is very important uh, in the U.S., you, I know you are going to tweet the one minute now because <laughs> yeah, it's impossible. But, but um, in the U.S., there is a movement now called uh, moral money. You know, what is incredible is that there is a vast amount of capital uh, floating all over the international, the global capital markets. They prefer to go to investments in uh, German Bund, for example, which is basically you are putting the money there because you don't get any any return because the risk profile, I mean, Germany is very well run. There is no risk there. So a lot of, of this global money, which is massive, doesn't go to developing countries because they perceive their perceptual risks is too big. So you see, this is where we have to work. And actually, your example was fitting perfectly in this. We have to work on reducing, mitigating this perceptional risk. If not, all this money will remain there with uh, five basis points of, uh, of, uh, of return, no risk whatsoever. And I like this idea that came out from California, moral money. If you have this huge amount of money as a pension fund, as a mutual fund, I mean, what is your social responsibility? It is something that makes you think. There is no answer, but I think it makes you think a little bit. So I think maybe, I know we are over time. If you're okay, we'll, maybe we'll just take one last question if there is one here in the audience. Yeah. Yes, of course. <laughs> 
Hi, my name is Harsh. I'm from the International Finance Corporation. My question is on the GDI itself. So this was the first time I uh, sort of, you know, encountered GDI. One of our case studies was profiled. Uh, I totally agree that, uh, you know, the approach of looking at delivery challenges is very unique. But at the same time, I wanted to understand, are there instances where these challenges and the lessons have then been factored in in programs and policies so that those mistakes aren't repeated? And the related question is, are there also, uh, is there also a thought to develop a similar sort of learning initiative which looks at success stories? Because, you know, given the seemingly insurmountable challenges that we have, sometimes success stories also encourage people to, you know, sort of take on those challenges and deliver. So that's my question. Anybody in the panel? Anselm, as uh, the GDI representative? Yeah, the lonely GDI representative. <laughs> <laughs> and doctor. But there are many here in the room who know, may know better than I do. Um, yeah, on the question how to build the delivery challenges in, in the program design, kind of, that is part of the GDI story, actually. Uh, we gather different types of information. We have, uh, I don't want to, to, be, to bore you on, on products. You can look them out. We have big data. So we're trying to accumulate the wealth of knowledge about what type of operation is facing, in which country, which sector is facing what type of delivery challenges. Across organizations, we have, I, I think, 10,000 or more uh, implementation uh, tasks evaluated on this one. So when you're designing something new, an operation, you go to our data bank and you tap in country, sector, approach, and you get the probability and percentage of the delivery challenges you're likely to run in because your peers run into exactly that when they did something similar. This is interesting, especially to people who do, like most of you, finance people, front-loading with operations, right? Where you have to be smart in the very beginning in the design phase. So that is, pri the GDI is offering that. And as far as I know, for those World Bank operations, you get that by default offered by the, by the system already. So at a specific point in your preparation of the operation, you get an, an email, or I don't know, from the system. But Deborah would be the one. There are more people here in the room who are part of the secretariat. So. Uh, Yes. So I just want to add to that. I think, um, I mean, it's great to hear about this and the database you have. And again, you're focusing a bit on the machine and less on the patient here, I think. <laughs> but um, it's, I mean, ultimately, it's all of our responsibilities, all of us in this room, to ensure that the lessons and the tacit knowledge that we have and colleagues have are then uh, captured and, and relayed back and uh, shared in a way that can have a much greater impact, a replica applicable multiplier effect. And I think, you know, the session, and from my experience working in different contexts on the climate, low carbon agenda, peer-to-peer -peer engagement is essential. You know, yes, great, you could go and look in a database. Personally, I wouldn't. I'm a bit of a technophobe when it comes to it. Um, I'd rather talk to someone who's been on the ground doing a project. That, I feel, is the way in which I can learn. And I think that's why the, this event today and tomorrow is so essential. It's not just to, you know, a sort of, we're all passive recipients of the information. It's more that we should be absorbing and learning from similar examples of work from peers that, that have encountered these problems. And I think, you know, I hope that GDI is bringing that in addition to the technology and, and she, database. She just explain our second product. I mean, we have five. Uh, and the second is exactly that. I mean, we have those 10,000 operations. And when you're looking for the profile of operation, you're designing, actually, we will offer you those are the most knowledgeable people in that type of operation from a delivery angle. So there will be three, four people popping up in the system with names and address and phone numbers. And you call them straight away. So we don't offer you like 10,000 pages to read. We give you the, the shortcut, right? You call them, you sit together, you tell them, listen, you have been in that pair of shoes. We are about to design an operation for that. So we try to integrate, I heard tacit, the tacit part and the explicit part, the science part and the craft part and the art part as well. So 
ultimately GDI is the place you go when you're in the design phase to anticipate, but you also go when you bump into, uh, into the delivery challenges in implementation, right? That is the, when you need to first bring. Mm. And just to come back to the dead patients, my, <laughs> image, my image in that, the picture I have is a program, an implementation is a living being to me, right? It's a system made by humans with living building blocks, humans, societies, organizations. So by definition to me, it's, it's a living thing, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not very far from our patient. Yeah. So at times what we're doing, we're dealing with a living system and we don't ask the right question. We are so occupied in putting up technology and knowledge, machines and stuff, that we forget to look at the patient, right? Yeah. And do we ask that question, is our program still alive? And what is a living program? So that was my But I think also when we look at the SIFs, there have been throughout, from the beginning, 10 years now of country uh, workshops. So all the PPCR countries coming together, all the FIP countries, all the SREP countries, the CTF, I don't know how many of those workshops have happened all over the world. And that has been continuous learning by doing, sharing of knowledge between peers, peer-to-peer -peer engagement. And I don't think we should sort of, you know, I think it's really important to recognize that as a feature of the SIFs, that it's that learning by doing, learning by sharing, learning by replicating has been, was built in from the very beginning. And, you know, this event here is obviously, you know, really valuable, but this has been a process, uh, a journey, a journey which I'm, many people in this room most people probably have been involved in. Great, and actually I'd, li I'd like to give our lone country representative from Jamaica, Claire, if you might have some last thoughts and perhaps uh, a message for the MDBs and the donor community. Okay, well let me start by addressing the recipient countries first. Um, so I'd like to say to us that our budget is a very powerful instrument for transformation. Because if we don't have resources to spend on the ground, we're not going to be able to do what needs to be done. And so the, a lot of us have um, climate data related projects. We have to ensure that the data is translated in a way that the economists and the accountants and everybody in our finance industry <coughs> understand because if we have them on our side then we have among the biggest advocates of climate change we also have to ensure that our policymakers understand the climate issue and in our case in Jamaica we have produced what we call um, policymakers guides to understanding climate change and every single member of parliament has been given a copy and we've had the scientists go to talk to them in the cabinet mm -hmm. to help them to understand that. So building advocates is an important element of transformation. The issue of the stakeholders <coughs> on the ground, how we <coughs> engage them, how we empower them, that remains an important element of transformation because I think someone said we need partnership in the climate action. And so I go back to re reiterate the statement um, made by our governments um, earlier this year, um, emphasizing the urgency of action. And so I want to reiterate that here, that all of us are in this together, uh, we like to say in Jamaica, we are all in the same boat. Um, <coughs> to the MDBs, um, we are looking to you to help us to bridge the technology, technical expertise, finance divide. We need, we need you there. Um, to our donors, we are asking you to understand, as again I said, we're all in the same boat. And as you help us by providing your resources um, to adapt and mitigate, we're also asking you to aggressively mitigate because most of the emissions come from your side um, of the world. 
And um, we're also asking the SIF um, with your visionary ethos to continue the kind of work that you've been doing. It really has been beneficial for us and we look forward to you helping us to break new grounds and to get the kinds of um, impact that uh, we need to get on the ground. So I'm seeing all of this as a grand partnership, um, each with a role to play, um, achieving synergy because synergy is what we're going to use to, to break the back of the, the dilemma um, that we face. And with that, I'd like to thank the SIF and GDI for this really excellent um, opportunity of sharing and learning. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to Claire, to Anselm, to Amali, to Ricardo. Sorry to keep you from your coffee, but I think this was a, a really fruitful and, and important discussion to have to just remember that in the end, the human being is at the heart of all of this and that it is truly an art to deliver the real change on the ground that we all seek to achieve. So thank you. Please have your coffee and then we'll send you off into the breakout sessions. We'll give you directions in the, in the coffee break. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Warning, 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 war